Hey gang, your buddy Platt here with a basic home brewing equipment 101. So let's go. All right, gang, and a bit of full disclosure. Uh, it's been kind of a uh, crazy week at work and some other things going on with me. Uh, I have a, a wine kit that I'll probably get to in the next week or two and some other things I wanted to brew up. Um, but being a little pressed for time, I, uh, I decided to do this short little video. I bottled some cider this week and kind of made me think back about some of the videos I've done before. I've done a, a, a video on bottling homebrew. I've done a video on homebrew sanitation. I've also covered the topic of homebrew legality and homebrew safety. Uh, so I thought this week I would do a quick little video on basic homebrewing equipment or kind of a basic homebrew equipment 101. Um, what I want to start off today with is pots. That's the first thing you'll need. You'll need some kind of stock pot, cooking pot. Um, this right here is probably what you start off with. What I started off with when I got into homebrewing with the Mr. Beer kits, your basic hop malt extract kits. Um, all you're really doing is adding a little extra hot water to it. So this I believe is a six quart uh, little pot, just heating up some water, adding the extract and going. Um, after you graduate those type of kits, you probably won't use this anymore. Maybe somewhere down the line once you get into all grain and you're doing a step mash, you may need an extra quart or two of water at a certain temperature. You may pull this out, but once you really get into home brewing, you'll never use this again. What you will need once you get into home brewing is some larger pots. This is a 12 quart stock pot and a 16 quart pot. Um, I prefer the stainless steel pots. You'll see stock pots. You go to a store like a Walmart, Target, what have you. You'll see stock pots. Some of them covered in like an enamel or uh, be different material. Stick to stainless. Easier to clean. You're not worried about chipping that enamel. And everything. Uh, I know your grandmother might have used an enameled uh, pot to make stews or whatever, but uh, go with the stainless. Also, go with a larger size pot than what you're planning on brewing. This 12 quart pot is what I use for one gallon brews, and my two gallon brews will go in the 16 quart pot. You just want to leave an extra head, extra head space. Uh, once you start getting into extract mash and partial mashes, uh, beers, you're you're going to have a chance of boil over, so you want to leave extra room. Um, once you get a little further in, you want to start doing five gallon and bigger batches. You're going to have to go with a significantly bigger pot. Um, those are th those size pots you're probably not going to find at a Walmart or a Target. Uh, you may have to go to your local kitchen supply or go to your homebrew shop if you have one. Also, too, once you start getting into that size, five, ten gallon pots or larger, your stove top probably is not going to create enough heat to, to uh, bring something like that up to a boil. You might have to start uh, taking this from the kitchen out to the garage or outside using a turkey burner. But uh, for our purposes, and in this channel, most it's mostly people who are starting to homebrew, again using kits and do, maybe doing some extract brewing water. These size pots are going to do, and you can find them most places at a fairly uh, reasonable price. So let's move on to uh, spoons. All right, the next piece of equipment I want to touch on real quick is uh, spoons. When, whenever we're doing either uh, you know a mash for a beer or I'm heating some uh, water for a meat or something, uh, we're always going to be stirring something. Um, I suggest going with the stainless steel spoon. Uh, easy to clean. Also, I'm not worried about any scratches or any places in here that bacteria might grow. Um, if not, if you don't have any of these, silicone or plastic ones are generally fine. You, again, easy to clean. And again, usually not too worried about any crevices or whatever where bacteria can grow. The reason I'm bringing this up is uh, I want to suggest people avoid wooden spoons. Um, besides the fact that if you're like me, you probably have trauma from your grandmother hitting you with a wooden spoon as a kid. Um, if, you, if you're if you anything into the culinary arts or whatever, you know the issues with wood cutting boards and bacterial growth. Same applies for wooden spoons. 
I just wouldn't use them if I don't have to. Uh, even if we're dealing with boiling wort, uh, when you go to cool it down, or if you just have to use that spoon, um, either stainless or again the silicone are a better option than wood. Next up is a piece of equipment. I touch on most of the videos uh, I do. I talk about doing a hydrometer reading or we talk about specific gravity, final gravity, original gravity of our solution. Um, and to uh, measure that gravity we use something called a hydrometer. Um, real quick what a hydrometer does is it's our base liquid. Uh, we want to. Um, there's a certain buoyancy to to each uh, to to liquid. Uh, water's 1.000, but when we start to, with a liquid that has some sugar in it, uh, something like a simple apple cider or apple juice or grape juice for homemade wine, or when we create a wort for beer. We're adding fermentables, we're adding something in there that increases the viscosity, the thickness of that liquid, the, also affects the buoyancy, as the bird knows, in that liquid. And, um, but we also know that once alcohol is produced in fermentation, that alcohol has a lower buoyancy, or if we just had pure alcohol to measure, it would be below one. It's, it's lighter than water. So it's that difference from when we start off with this liquid that's full of sugar, then we start the fermentation process, and then we lower that buoyancy. We may, in like a simple cider, in our cider kit that we had uh, recently, our original gravity with all that sugar in there was 1.045. After fermentation, we got down to 1.005. That alcohol lightened up that liquid, and to make that measurement, we used Again, this hydrometer. Um, you can, when you buy one of these hydrometers, you can use the tube that it comes in. To me, it's a little small, makes reading a little more difficult. So they, most brew shops, or if you shop online, will find these bigger tubes that, to me, just give a better reading. Um, if you have a big five-gallon fermenter or, or, or larger vessel like that, uh, sometimes even in um, in the breweries themselves, the, the giant fermentation vat, they'll just drop the thing in and give it a spin and, and do the reading right there. Plenty of space, but for home purposes, the hydrometer and the test tube um, are again a piece of equipment that you'll want. Uh, if you're just using the home brewing equipment or uh, home brewing kits, like the Mr. Beer or the Brew Demon, what have you, they kind of talk you through the process. If you follow it, you're gonna hit all your numbers. You really don't need the hydrometer, but once you start doing extract brew, partial mash, really getting home brewing, you'll definitely want one of these. Alright, the next piece of equipment I want to talk about is probably the most important because no matter what we're making, beer, wine, cider, meat, what have you, is we're always going to end up having our liquid in the fermenter. Uh, we're always going to be fermenting stuff so we need a fermenter. The most basic type of fermenter is actually the container the liquid comes in. Um, if you're making just a simple home you know, hard cider or just like uh, my video, The Simplest Way to Make Booze, where we just made homemade wine, uh, that container that, that juice comes in works just fine as fermenter. Um, if you think about it, it's uh, it was sanitized when the juice was put in. Uh, it's food grade material, obviously, you know, if it's being sold at stores or what have you. Um, all you really need to do is just make sure that CO2 can escape and there's no pressure buildup. But that's the simplest form of uh, fermenters. Now once you really get into home brewing, although you will want to upgrade uh, to, for, you know, you know, uh, specific purpose fermenters. First one we'll look at is um, the one gallon, these are called carboys. Uh, they also come in larger six gallon sizes for when you use, uh, for when you produce five gallon batches of beer. Uh, I really like these one gallon ones because it lets me produce smaller batches. I'm not not having to produce big batches. If I really want to experiment, you know, I don't have to ruin five gallons of beer if I make, make a mistake. I'll only uh, ruin one. Or if I'm doing a bigger batch but I want to split some off and maybe I dry hop or added, you know, some fruit in or whatever, these are great. Um, 
couple of downsides to these type of fermenters. A, you notice a small top or a small neck makes cleaning difficult, especially if I was to dry hop or add fruit or anything else in during fermentation. It makes cleanup hard. And also to its glass, it could potentially break. And trust me, I broke a few of these. It's a disaster when you have a fermenter break on you. Uh, next fermenter I'll we'll look at is one that probably a lot of people, especially if you started uh, home brewing 20 plus years ago like I did, um, is the classic five gallon plastic bucket fermenter. Um, if you went to a home brewing store 15, 20 years ago, most likely the first kit, the most basic kit they're going to sell you is a five gallon kit. They'll give you uh, the malt extract, their hops, everything you need for your first batch. They'll, they may sell you some bottles, cappers, all that stuff, but they would give you this five gallon bucket. Um, this is really just pretty much a generic five gallon food grade bucket. Um, when I started working in restaurants 30 something years ago, we used to get pickles in five gallon buckets just like this, the lids, everything. Um, actually, I read on top, the lids are made by the same company that we got those pickle buckets from. Um, the only real difference is, besides the, the home brewing logo and paraphernalia, is there's a hole in the top drilled with a grommet specifically designed for the airlock that goes in there and we'll talk about airlocks a little bit later. Uh, these are great. Um, again, they're plastic so I'm not worried about breaking. They're pretty sturdy. Again, they're, they're food grade plastic. Um, in all reality, if you had access to a five gallon pickle bucket or whatever and just wanted to drill a hole in the lid or whatever, you could do that. Uh, but again, if you're getting the kit, you're new to it, these are these are just fine. Um, next, I want to talk about a couple of specialized uh, fermenters. Uh, these are fermenters that come with the homebrew kits. Uh, this is the Mr. Beer fermenter, and this is the Brew Demon fermenter. Um, again, these kits, just like this five-gallon one, they're sold as part of the kit. Um, what I like about these two is they're kind of best of both worlds. They're smaller, so I can do smaller batches. Um, but they're plastic like the big one, um, so I'm not worried about breakage. Uh, these two are also designed uniquely in the, in the fact that, like with the Mr. Beer kit, they have a notch in the lid that allows the CO2 to escape without anything getting in. Uh, the Brew Demon has this little, little valve that allows the air out, again, without stuff getting in. Um, so you don't have a traditional airlock. That's one less thing that can possibly get contaminated, what have you. Also, these two come with spigots that make bottling easier. Um, one thing I really like about this Brew Demon, and I'll move this to let you see, is its conical shape. If you go to your local brewery, brew pub, or whatever, you'll notice that they have giant fermenters that look or are shaped just like this. Now, they're not two gallons or 200 gallons or more, but they're conical shape and that, that cone shape on the bottom allows the yeast to settle further down, down below this spick, and so when you go to bottle, you're not getting yeast in uh, with it. It, it kind of helps separate that yeast better. The Mr. Beer has a lower bottom where that yeast settles, but a lot of times when you're bottling, you kind of have to tilt this thing so you get that last bottle or whatever. And you're going to get a little bit of yeast in that one where the brew demon, you kind of dodge that. But uh, overall, there's are fun fermenters. And like I said, you can use uh, a lot of different things for fermenters. Uh, when we talk about airlocks, I'll talk, tell you about how you can convert other, uh, other jugs, containers, or whatever into a fermenter. All right, the next piece of equipment we're going to talk about is a vital little piece of equipment. Um, and it goes along with the fermenters we just talked about, and that is the airlock. Uh, what airlock does is it allows CO2 to escape, but it prevents bacteria in the air, what have you, or any little creepy crawlies from getting into your solution. Uh, the way it does it is this would go into the fermenter, and you'd have a some kind of seal that would make sure it's kind of airtight, and then the CO2 would come up. You would have this either filled with about halfway full with water. Some people use vodka for sanitation purposes, but water's just fine. And then the CO2 would leak out 
expand. There's, there's small holes in the top to let this vent out, but again, we're not letting anything um, get inside. Um, those specialty fermenters like the Mr. Beer and the Brew Demon, again, they kind of have their own built in, but these are kind of used anywhere else for any other fermenters. Um, the big five gallon one has, like I said, a little hole drilled that fits perfectly for this. Um, if you want to use another container, like this one gallon carboy, or a one gallon, let's say we were making one gallon of cider from unpasteurized cider that came with the container. Um, those containers, the, the tops aren't made for this, so you can get one of these rubber bungs. They kind of, this kind of works as a converter and voila, now you could turn any kind of jug with a, with a hole, you know, about an inch, two inch, whatever wide or so, you could convert that into a fermenter and have your airlock to allow CO2 escape. Um, if, if you want to create a poor man's airlock, you could take a balloon on top and just burp it every once in a while. But again, if you're getting into home brewing and want to use different vessels, shapes, what have you, fermenters, um, it's good to have more than just one of these. Uh, these are usually just a couple of bucks and the, the bungs are a buck or two. <clears throat> so you can get you three or four. Um, when, when time to uh, reuse whatever, you'll have to take this all apart, sanitize everything. But again, just a little piece of equipment that provides a vital job in home brewing. All right, the next piece of equipment I want to talk about is something, um, again, something you would use when you're taking the next step up. Um, if, um, if you're doing something that requires a secondary fermentation, you're going to have to move liquid from one fermenter to the other. Uh, one thing I, I think I've touched in a couple videos is when you're, once fermentation starts, you don't want to shake up that liquid, you don't want to stir it up or whatever. That uh, introduces oxygen into the mix and that could help oxidize it. Um, if you're making a wine, you can end up turning it into vinegar that way. So you don't want to stir up that liquid, but sometimes you need to move that liquid. Um, either you're moving it off dead yeast in the first fermenter or you're putting it in a second fermenter to add additional hops or flavor, something like that. So what you would use is, um, well, your first option would be just to get a simple piece of surgical tubing like this and do the old school siphon thing where you're like, but you don't want to be putting your mouth on that. That's a sanitation issue or whatever, so you don't want to do that. So the next level is using something called a racking cane. Um, real simple, you would connect this tube and you would give this a pump or two and this creates enough suction where it's now pulling. You have this down in your first fermenter, give it a couple of pumps and it would create enough suction to where you, now you're, you're pulling the liquid from the first fermenter into the second fermenter. Uh, you would have the other end sitting in that fermenter. And this is a great way of transferring the liquids as the bird knows, a uh, great way of transferring the liquids without stirring, splash, splashing, you know, over oxidizing that liquid. Comes in real handy uh, for that. Uh, one little attachment that would come with this package when you come, down, come time to bottle, let's say you move in that second fermenter, let it finish sec secondary fermentation, you're ready to bottle. You'd use the same setup, but on the other end of the tube, you'd add something called the bottling wand. And what it has in the bottom is a little spring-loaded device here that you put in the bottom of the bottle. And that allows you to fill the bottle from the bottom up. And again, that helps prevent splashing, helps prevent oxygen getting in there. Um, overall, should help, again, prevent things like oxidization and turning uh, your wine into vinegar. This is a neat little attachment, like I said, in the end of the racking cane. And this is for if you don't have a fermenter that has a spigot on the bottom. Again, those specialty fermenters I was talking about have them. Uh, the big five gallon ones, they, they sometimes sell five gallon what they call bottling buckets that will have spigots on the bottom. And that kind of helps eliminate that need. But if you, if you have to, the, this bottling wand is really good for filling your bottles without uh, too much oxidization. All right, the next piece of equipment I want to talk about, you might not think of as an equipment, but I, again, it plays a vital role in this whole process, and that's the bottles themselves that we're going to put our brew in. Um, 
real important. You could go to your local brew shop or go online or whatever and buy cases of bottles for home brewing. Uh, the easiest way is most likely you're into craft beer yourself, whatever you're consuming beer already. So it's just easier to save those bottles. Um, I do suggest don't save your green bottles or your clear bottles. Uh, if you don't know, uh, light can affect the flavor of your beer. So clear bottles and uh, green bottles don't do a good job of keeping the light out. Um, if you drink enough green bottled beer, you probably notice there's a little skunkiness to most of those beer, and that's again partially due to the light that gets into that beer. So we want to avoid that. Save your dark bottles. Um, also save bottles that aren't twist tops. You don't want to save your Bud Light, Miller Light bottles. They have twist tops. The caps that you'll put on those beers don't fit on those twist top bottles, so don't save those. Uh, the two standard sizes generally are 12 ounce bottles and the 22 ounce bombers. Um, there are other bottles out there. Uh, I will talk about one other bottle I don't have an example of with me right now is the Kolsch bottles or the with the swing top lids. Uh, those are fun for homebrew. One great thing about it with that type of lid, uh, it releases pressure a little easier. Uh, that being said, you will need to clean and sometimes disassemble that and that becomes a little difficult. Um, sometimes just pop the tops a little easier. Uh, one other variation on the bottles I do want to talk about. Um, with a lot of the kit beers, again, uh, Mr. Beer, Brew Demon, uh, Coopers, just to name a few, they will come with these plastic bottles. Um, generally they're one liter, uh, sometimes we'll have two liter bottles, but these are one liter or half liter bottles. Um, they, the great thing about the plastic is, A, you're not worried about breakage. Um, B, they also have these re reusable lids, twist top lids. Um, that makes your life easier as far as capping bottles, um, needing caps. Uh, these are reusable, so you're not having to get more caps to reuse. Also, one good thing, another good thing about these is when you, if you're doing bottle conditioning, you, you know, you add a little bit of sugar, we're getting our carbonation, we're, we're doing that in the bottle. Um, sometimes you get what's called bottle bombs. There's too much carbonation, pressure builds up. When you, when you cap these bottles, there's really no way to know if, if we're getting carbonation or not. If it's working, you just kind of have to open it, drink it, and guess. Well, when you use these plastic bottles, you can come along every few days and give these a squeeze. And if that bottle feels firmer, you know we're getting carbonation. You know it's working. If the bottle gets real rock hard, you know you might be having a bottle bomb. And I've had enough of those happen to me you know, where it's not, it's not a welcome experience to pop a beer and just have it explode on you. So that is the advantage to these. Again, you can either get them with a kit or you can go online and buy them. Um, real quick on that, I'm going to have a link, my affiliate link on Amazon down below on all these pieces of equipment. In full disclosure, I do get a referral fee, so if you buy something, it is much appreciated. Uh, real quick with these, when you come time to cap them, you'll need a bottle capper. Again, one of these are not twist tops, so you're going to need this to, what it does is it presses down on that crown of that cap and seals around the bottle. You'll need one of these. Um, again, earlier when I was talking about the five gallon fermenter and the standard kits a lot of places sell, they will throw this in there because they realize if you're new to home brew, you probably don't have this. Um, you know, either it will come with a kit like that or you can buy these individually, again, through your brew shop. Um, so next, let's talk about the last but possibly most important piece of equipment and that is a thermometer. All right, so the last piece of equipment we're going to talk about, uh, I know I've said all these pieces of equipment are important, but I actually almost mean it this time, is a uh, thermometer. Um, even with your simple home brew kits like your Mr. Beer and your Brew Demon, where you're just going to boil some water, add your extract, blend it all together, then throw in some cold water, even with that, you're going to have to get that wort down to a certain temperature before you can pitch the yeast. Yeast only survives in a certain temperature range and we don't want to throw it into work that's too hot so we're still going to need to know if that works cool enough roughly 80 degrees or so so one of these basic old school uh, manual thermometers will do 
Uh, this is something you would probably use to check, see if a pork loin's at the right temperature or if you're doing a roast or something like that. Uh, these work just fine for something like that. Now once you get a little further along into home brewing, you're going to start doing mash-ins, partial mash, all grains. You're going to have to hit specific temperatures and these dials are, are kind of vague. Also too, these type of thermometers kind of need recalibrating every once in a while. Um, it's simple enough to do, you can find it online how to do it, but again, you don't want to go through all that mess. And also, like I said, you're trying to hit specific uh, temperature points, so you want one of these electric thermometers. They're real easy, turn on and off. You can switch from Fahrenheit to Celsius. Um, this one, one of the, the shorter thermometers, one of the downfalls of them is you're kind of holding this over a boiling, you know, almost boiling mash to make sure you're hitting temperature, you're getting a little hot. They do sell variations of these now that have a little stand where it has all the electronics and the readings and whatever, and it'll have a little cord where you just leave it in the brew pot and you can kind of read it from a distance. You don't have to be holding your hand over it, but it gives you a very accurate reading. Um, again, lets you know that you're hitting these critical temperature points, and again, when you're doing step mashing or decoction mashing or whatever, that, that becomes uh, quite important. Uh, these type of thermometers you can find almost anywhere, your local grocery store or Walmart, Kmart, you know, what have you, and uh, you don't have to get too crazy with them. Well, that's about to wrap it up. Again, this is just the basics. I know some home brewers, would, there's more pieces of equipment or certain kits or uh, certain uh, brew stands that have multiple vessels, stuff like that. That's a little over our head, but this is this is the basics. You get these pieces of equipment down and you have these pieces of equipment, you can produce a lot of different beers, wine, meat, ciders, what have you, and uh, you should be able to make a good product with a, a decent bit of confidence. Uh, well, I hope you liked this video. If you did, please subscribe down below. Also, please like the video because it lets YouTube know we're putting out good comment or good content. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or any other pieces of equipment that you want me to talk about, please leave it in the comment section below, or you can always contact me on the Twitter page. Till next time, bottoms up.